Our guest today is Lisa Apolinsky. She's a digital marketing strategist, author, and speaker. Lisa, welcome to our show today. Thank you so much, Christopher. I'm so excited to be here. When I looked at your profile, I saw storytelling. And as you know, I'm a story-based leadership expert and keynote speaker. So I'm like, this woman is my kind of girl. <laughs> and I'd love to have you on my show. Now, for me, the story that I most love sharing is about my uncle. He came here as an immigrant from Hong Kong. His name is Uncle Ding. And at 12 years old, for me growing up in New York City, I was teased and punished and bullied as a kid. So for him to hire me at age 12, in New York City to help him with his business, it really gave me an understanding of how to build a business from a 12 year old. I didn't know it at the time how powerful that was, but do you have any stories for yourself how you began this entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my parents were entrepreneurs in their own right. Um, you know, my um, father actually purchased a drugstore when we were young. I was about four at the time when he uh, purchased a drugstore to run. And um, from that age up until when he sold the drugstore, I was about 16 or so at the time. Um, you know, I got to see every aspect of running a business, including how to interact with customers on a very personal basis. Mm. Um, you know, at that time, pharmacists actually did some consulting, and my father had a medical background, so he was able to have conversations with the customers who brought in prescriptions and talk to them and find out how they were doing and what other medication they were taking, which wasn't really thought of in that time. If you think about like, you know, the seventies and eighties yeah. um, and just being able to have those one-on-one -on -one interactions and seeing those, you know, uh, one particular uh, thought that comes to mind, there was a, a customer, his name was Francois. He was actually from France. And uh, I was learning French at the time and he had Parkinson's and my father would have a conversation with him about, you know, how are your symptoms going? How is the medication working? What other support system do you have? And my dad, because my dad was also very good with languages, he spoke um, three. Uh, he would make me have a conversation with Francois in French, trying to kind of uh, also get that same information <laughs> It was a little challenging, but anything to kind of really push us as children to have that type of interaction uh, was instilled in me when I was really very young. See, Lisa, that's a very fascinating story because Steve Jobs gave a speech coming on 10 years now at Stanford University. He talked about how you can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can connect the dots looking backward. And looking back in your life, to have that foundation with your father, with, and your mother at this, this drugstore. And literally a lot of people nowadays are like, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur, it's so cool. But you at such a young age saw really what it meant to be an entrepreneur. It was, it's not always flashy, it's not always exciting, <laughs> but you saw that in your own life and your own parents' life. So I'm curious, yeah. when did you decide to be your own business owner? So I look at my mess to success story, that's how I call it. Um, the moment in time where I actually had the thought of being my own, you know, business owner to have my own company. July of uh, 20, I'm sorry, January of 2013, um, I was in a hotel room in Milan. I had just done another brutal 12, 14 hour day. And I was on the phone with my sister and I was complaining as to, you know, I'm doing all this work, uh, people don't listen to me, you know, I know how to do this, you know, I know how to, you know, outreach and use digital. And at that time, I had been doing some side work with, with uh, non-compete organizations, people in completely different industries who I'd worked with in the past, who knew I knew how to do things and had been, you know, asking me on the side, can you help me with this strategy or help me with this problem? And I had been doing that on the side. And my sister asked me, you know, a question. Well, how does that make you feel when you're working with, with these, other, these other clients? And I was like, oh, my God, it makes me feel like a superhero. You know, I get to come in. I get to help them. I get to help them really solve their problem and watch them move forward. And the question she asked me is, well, why aren't you doing that full time? And I had never thought of that. I, it never had crossed my mind to actually do that, what I love to do, and devote my time to that versus the company I was with. That was my aha moment. 
And that's amazing. And literally I'm looking at you and your, one of your photos persuade with the digital content store. It looks like a superhero. Yep. And ultimately, did you write that book first or was it Weathering the Digital Storm first? So I wrote Weathering the Digital Storm first. Um, I wrote that. It came out in 2019. Um, I knew that something was coming. <laughs> uh, I could feel that there was, you know, you can't have this economic boom forever. And I knew things were going to happen. And so I started talking to my clients about preparing for the storm that was coming. Um, and my clients were actually very, very grateful when this pandemic hit because they were set and ready to go. Um, all of those clients are doing very well. I'm so pleased. Um, wrote that book. And then when the pandemic hit, I was starting my next story or my next book, which is uh, Persuade with a Digital Content Story with uh, Henry DeVries. Um, and I realized while I was writing that book and we had start having all of these issues, shutdowns, unemployment, global pandemic, supply chains, you know, just dying, whole industries just being decimated. And I knew that content was a key factor in getting out to people, especially digital content. You're not getting in front of them right now. <laughs> You're having to shelter in place. So how do you get into their living rooms, their homes where they're at, and that's through digital content. But it can't just be random acts of content. You have to have purpose with your content, and people love stories. People are hardwired for stories. If you think about when you were growing up and you were read stories at bedtime, or reading books, or even watching movies, um, if I say to you, once upon a time, you know it's story time. It's, it's time to sit down and, and get all snuggled up and listen to a great story. We are hardwired for stories. So why not leverage how people already take in information in a positive manner and use it to share your story? And every single person has a story to tell. You may not believe it, but you do have a story and your story does matter. Yeah. Now that's a very profound point and a very simple one that we, we can all digest. Like I give speeches on story-based leadership where I teach my clients how to use stories based on science, how to build rapport and trust with their clients. So you do that in the digital world. And again, it's one thing to be a storyteller, another thing to be a digital marketing person. And I'm impressed because you're like Wonder Woman and Superman together. <laughs> so talk to us about your journey about now you had this epiphany, this aha moment with your sister, right. you're in Milan giving her a conversation. But when did you realize you had an expertise in digital marketing first? And then we'll talk about storytelling. Um, so I've been doing digital marketing really since uh, 1999. So I was trained in traditional marketing. Um, I remember doing uh printing off letters <laughs> and doing mail what merges. are those lisa <laughs> i know doing mail merges and actually having to match addresses with letters and put them on envelopes and stuff envelopes and then take them and put them in the i mean you're talking like real you know postcards like basic basic stuff while i was still building a website and doing email so i had these dual uh, ways of communicating with my customer and my prospect. Um, and I really believe that that foundation has led me to have this type of expertise that's not only wide, but it's deep. Yeah. Um, you know, I learned each aspect as it came. Um, you know, in 1999 and 2000, it was all about the web experience. And everything was on websites and understanding how to use websites and things like having your content above the fold. I mean, there's all sorts of language that we used to talk about and then moving to email and then moving to social media and now moving to video and SMS. Um, it's just, it's a, it's an evolution, but because of my background, I was able to really stay with it and also in the companies that I worked for, and I've worked for some Fortune 50 companies, um, marketing, especially digital marketing in that time, was not 
really believed in. Um, they give you a little bit of money, but really your budgets were very, very scarce. Everything went to sales because they believe sales would lead. Um, and marketing was really just for support. So to have very little budget, you have to get really, 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 you know, innovative in how you do things. And one of the ways that I saved money was I learned how to do it myself versus outsourcing. And then just trying to figure out the, the least expensive way path in order to get there. And digital content for me is one of those paths. Every single person can do digital content. Anybody yeah. that tells you, I'm not a writer, you can talk. You can actually do a video blog. No one really can say I can't put out digital content because that's not true. Yeah. Because um, if you're having a conversation, you are communicating. And if you just record it and put it out, that's considered digital content. Yeah. But again, we don't want to do random acts of content. We want to think about what we're creating and why we're creating it and what message we want to share with that outside audience. Well, that's why they hire you, right? And you're being modest. Yeah. I mean, you're literally a pioneer in digital marketing. And just so our listeners and viewers know, the whole digital world, for me, frankly, I'm a corporate guy. I used to work for American Express in Wall Street in New York 20 years ago. And when I started diving into this online digital world, five years ago, I wrote this book about networking with billionaires and executives. I started doing these webinars and whatnot. And one of the epiphanies for me that I want our listeners to know at how profound having an audience online is, and just to really highlight the point, I'm doing this webinar, staring at the camera, realizing not at the time how ridiculous it is to stare at a camera and talk, as you're saying, everyone can talk, but it was odd for me to be talking to myself essentially, but there are hundreds of people registered from 30 countries. And when they would actually watch this webinar and then like my stuff, they would buy my program. I was like, whoa. So what I'm letting our viewers know is the impact you make is not just for them, but the global scalable impact that you'll have for their company because ultimately, as soon as, as one of my mentors said, who is a founding board member at Google, when you go digital online, you're literally global day one. Yes. So when they have you there, you have this great perspective, this depth and this understanding of what the past was, the foundations of storytelling. But now in the digital world, it blew my mind relative to this webinar experience. Now, the other thing is, in terms of our listeners to see know how powerful you are, I was shocked, frankly, Lisa, at how specific, detailed, and analytical you can get in this digital marketing world. Can you share with us about how specific and analytical you can get with the digital marketing world? Absolutely. So... Data has been driving everything. And I know a lot of people think, oh, big data. I look at data as kind of like you are solving a murder mystery. Wow. You have a couple of clues, right, of what's happening. And then you should be posing additional questions to add in more pieces of information to figure out who done it. <laughs> so if you look at your data that way, it doesn't get so overwhelming. If you pick a couple pieces of data, like I'd like to understand, you know, who comes to my website and how long they stay or what pages they go, go through. And there's so much information that's collected right now that you can actually really watch a buyer's journey throughout your, um, throughout your digital assets. It doesn't matter. Even if they're disjointed, you can still track them. It's, actually pretty fun. Um, and a lot of this stuff is very much standard at this point. So it's not like you have to recreate the wheel. If you're not sure how to do it, you can even Google it. I mean, there's a YouTube video out there that can show you how to use UTM codes or whatnot. Um, but having that curiosity about who's looking at your brand and why makes you show up in a in a much more profound way for your audience. If you can see that they're going to two certain pages, let's say that for me, they're going to, um, you know, digital content. And um, one of the other offerings that we have now is uh, reviewing your budget. So you actually understand how to apply your budget within, you know, your confines and what your goals are. So you're not just kind of guessing. There's actually a science to that. And I see that they're doing that. Well, then maybe I want to put out content that talks about one aspect of budgeting. That have you looked at your 
uh, contracts with your vendors lately? Do you actually understand what it is that you paid for and what it is you should be getting? And it's not that they're trying to mess with you or screw you. Maybe they've simply forgotten that they promised X, Y, Z, and you're like, oh, hey, I should be getting this too. Can I make sure I get that? So you're actually getting more for the money you're spending. That's me. If you're not doing that, looking at your vendor contracts every year, you could actually be leaving indirect cost, you know, indirect money on the table, right? Things like that. So understanding that and then putting out content based on what your audience is looking for, that's what all of us want. And that's just one aspect of what you can get out of your data. Yeah, I mean, what confounds me and shocks me, frankly, you say it's fun. I say it's something that's scary <laughs> because you can literally, just like a, a, a touch screen, if you go to ATM machine, you know where I'm actually even touching the screen on the laptop or my phone. And that's the scary thing. We know Christopher spent 17 seconds on this tab and he's hovered around this part and he scrolled down and it's scary. So talk about this buyer's experience, just so our listeners know how profound. So I know that they can go online and Google some stuff, but they still need an expert like you to literally walk them through how to craft this story with intentions. Talk about this buyer journey you mentioned before. Sure. So when you're looking at purchasing something, there is an awareness phase that, hmm, I actually probably want this. There's the research phase, the consideration phase. Okay, what, what aspects am I looking for and what's the best fit? Who's the best vendor to help me? And then there's the post-purchase phase. What kind of support do I need afterwards to help me use the product or remove any kind of uh, buyer dissonance, cognitive dissonance, where I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have bought that. Let me go return it, right? Because <laughs> that happens. <laughs> you know, we unfortunately, you know, because we actually have brains that are thoughtful, we actually can look back and go, eh, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So the awareness doesn't necessarily mean that I have to have the problem completely identified for everybody. If you think about Amazon and the idea of this e-commerce platform where you're actually bringing other vendors in to sell to somebody else. You and I 15 years ago weren't like, you know, I really could use an app where, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that never, never crossed our consciousness. But, you know, Jeff Bezos and all of his, you know, intellect said, you know, this actually could revolutionize how things work and maybe I should create that and just see what happens um, there are so many people out there that have an idea of you know what would be really interesting or you know what could actually be impactful and they never really explore it um, if you have an entrepreneurial spirit like we're talking about that's something that you'll actually want to research and look at and see how can I actually test this and take it to market um, and making that first leap is probably the, the hardest thing you have to do, right? Because you have to get over your initial momentum to get into that. Yeah. Um, that's probably the hardest thing, actually understanding what that first phase of the customer journey is, that awareness, which is your own awareness, and then actually start to launch a product. Because once you're through there, then it's really showing up in that consideration stage and talking about, this is what I've seen other people struggle with. You know, would you like to know how this other person went from where you are now to where you wanna go? I do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And getting through that and then your post buyer journey, looking at how can I support you so that you're using this product in every way it was intended, not just in one way, every single aspect of the product and making sure that you, you know, enjoy it, you leverage it and you actually use it to solve your problem. Because if they do that and they're like, this was awesome. Now you have a whole bunch of little ambassadors that will run out <laughs> and tell everybody, Oh, if you need to do X, Y, Z, you should use, this or you should use so and so. Yeah. Well, they should use you, Lisa, because the thing is, a lot of times people try to do it themselves 
And I tell people, I have clients that hire me to give keynote speeches, like mm-hmm. Discover Card or other companies around the world. And then I have clients that hire me to help them become keynote speakers and online coaches. And I say, it took me 20 years. You want to spend 20 years figuring this stuff out? I'm like, no, just like with me in my world or your world, Lisa, the information you're giving is so profound and pertinent because like I said, in the digital world, I don't know if a lot of people over 35 realize how quickly you can generate and scale your business if they have someone like you who isn't just in this for two or three years, isn't some millennial, no disrespect from millennials, but I see a lot of millennials quoting that they're experts and they yeah. may even have like three clients. Whereas you, you have this breadth of 20 years of experience, but I want our listeners and viewers to know that the ability to scale your company has never been more possible now. And I use myself as an example. Like literally, I can turn on a computer and off computer. Yeah. But for me to have an online program where I started four years ago, and I already, I already have clients in 120 cities, 30 countries, and six continents, it's ridiculous. But I want our listeners to know that I am not a good tech person. That's why I have people like you in my life that say, hey, Lisa, can you please help me? Because that world you live in, I frankly, I'm a great storyteller. But digitally, that's not really my thing. So can you share with us some stories, either from your book or actual clients you work with? Really talk about this buyer experience that they had no clue, no understanding, no, a lot of struggles. And you really help them walk through this thing. And ultimately, they're doing very well now. Sure. So, um, you know, and, and just to really quickly go back when you were talking about, you know, building your right team, right? And bringing in the people that, that kind of Experts. fill out your expertise. The most powerful sentence in the world is, I know a guy. (laughs) Or gal. (laughs) Right? Or gal. I know someone. So always be okay to, you know, look at that and and see if you don't have the expertise to bring in somebody else. I think that's totally, totally acceptable. Um, So one of the stories I can share with you um, is around um, a customer or a client that I had that had a new product launch. Um, new to um, the industry, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big me too strategist. I don't think me too strategies work. It's okay to bring in a product that you believe will be improved, but there has to actually be something that improves it versus saying, well, I think this is a new idea and better. Um, Like you actually have to look at, okay, if you're taking product A and moving it to product B, what other problem are you solving to to help your customer be more successful, you know, do less with more, ease of use, reliability, I mean, you choose, um, and actually map that out. Um, But one of the, the clients that I was working with, with this new product, they had an idea of, and it was a, it's a, the individual I was talking to um, was the CMO. Um, It's a very large um, manufacturing company, um, US-based manufacturing company, Um, new product. And the idea was, again, because uh, of experiences from other products, They were trying to take the customer base from product A and apply product B, right? Well, I think they'll they'll want this. And I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just that it was assumed. No data behind it, no actual research, no, no actually talking to the customer, you know, things like that. And in the digital world, there is no excuse for not yeah. getting a poll survey something from your customer base they will tell you if that's something they want and why they would want it and if you can get that information up front and then incorporate that into your communication you're helping them understand what it is you're bringing to the table and, and let's focus on that one point lisa because again yeah. that one point of the fact that so many people think, oh, I think I might have this color or that kind of like, no, no, no. In the digital world, you can study everything. And that's why we have to remove our egos and say, Lisa, you're an expert. You analyze things. It's not what you think. It's like, no, show me the data. That's why they have A-B testing. Whereas in the past, you have your PR firm, you give them a retainer fee. You don't know where it's going to go. You put ads in the radio or you have a a billboard at the side of the road. You don't really know. They kind of know. Even on TV, they kind of know between age 25 and 35, but no, you, 
your world, your experience. Again, I was shocked, frankly. It's, it's really scary that you know literally what smartphone I have, what zip code I am, how much money. It's, it's really scary so that yeah. when people do work with you, I just want them to know how just scary it is. But again, you are a person <laughs> of ethics and understanding and, and you walk them through. But again, it's all about servicing your clients. So when you have this ability to analyze, not assume, because I've right. so many clients that say, oh, Christopher, I need to write a book before I be a, become a speaker. I'm like, no, you don't. Oh, Christopher, I have to improve my speaking skills before I become a yeah. paid speaker. I'm like, no, you don't. They yeah. have these assumptions yeah. that it's they that just- should. They get stuck on the should. Exactly. I should have a book. I should market to these people. I should. And it's not based on, it's, it's based on- What our they own think in their mind. And our perspective, right? Yeah, it has nothing to do with actual reality. I mean, you got to start somewhere, but that's where the data comes in. And again, having the ability to outreach to your prospects and your clients to ask them, does this make sense? Why go out and do a marketing campaign and then get that feedback if you could get it initially and save yourself all that pain and aggravation? Yeah. Um, and this should really be re reviewing your data having conversations. And again, it goes back to, I look at what I watched my dad do, right? Having those conversations, understanding what the customer wants by actually asking them and talking to them and see what they want. It doesn't have to be some big scaled event, but sitting and saying, you know, hey, I'd like to ask you a few questions. And you probably have customers that that are your, I like to call them our super champions, um, the ones that literally, you know, will buy your swag and they will stand on the corner and they'll hold up a sign and they're like, oh, I love this product. And, and there are people like that and that's great. Um, I thought loyalists to brands had kind of died and it seems like it's resurging, which is fantastic. It's kind of like picking your football team. Um, and maybe that's why it's happening because we don't have a lot of, games being played right now so we got to get behind something and cheer so maybe that's it possibly um but asking them and having feedback that is real you yeah, don't want yeah. someone just telling you oh, that looks great <laughs> you want someone that's actually going to go you know that looks dumb or i don't understand this or why are you saying that um so you want to have that system in place and i am a huge believer in applying a scientific method to what you do. If you can repeat it, you get better at it, you get more efficient at it, and you're not spending as much time and resources getting from point A to point B if you have your process in place. Yeah. So, and, and in my book, and actually in both my books, there are actual formulas and processes and things that you can follow because why recreate? Yeah. R and D, Robin Duplicate. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know what, Lisa, that's a perfect way to end our show, frankly, because when I look at the book, Weathering the Digital Storm, real entrepreneurship, there are gonna be storms. It's not if but when. And exactly. I love the fact that you've been really clear on the digital marketing expertise you have, but the storytelling is really the secret sauce. And you combine the two, I have no doubts that your clients, anyone listening, definitely reach out to Lisa because you will go through a storm. You will have to weather things, but at least you have Lisa there with this clarity as essentially your pilot to get through those storms, to rise above that. I have no doubts that your clients and the world would be so much better off, Lisa. So thank you so much for being on our show. Really thank appreciate you. it. Have a great day. Thank you.